Hello, my name is Laura Northup, and today I'll be discussing my research on the character Angelo's metaphorical fall from heaven in Shakespeare's Measure for Measure. When discussing Shakespeare's Measure for Measure, it's important to take into account the significance of the play for its time period. Measure for Measure is notorious for the suggestive nature of the plot and of the characters. Sex is a definitive motif present throughout the entirety of the play. The desire for sexual satisfaction drives certain characters' actions, especially Angela, the deputy and potential successor of the AWOL Duke Vincentio of Vienna. Angelo undergoes severe changes to his psyche upon meeting Isabella, a prospective nun looking to save her brother from being put to death. These changes occurred because he failed to experience Sigmund Freud's stages of sexual development, within which a child learns to appropriately control sexual desires. This failure to develop is what triggered Angelo's established tripartite psyche to devolve into an unbalanced one, creating a lustful being willing to throw out his morals in exchange for intimacy. While Angelo might have portrayed a lawful evil antagonist throughout the work, he certainly did not rise to power with ill intentions. Martha Widmayer's To Sin and Loving Virtue defines Angelo's persona before his downfall as fulfilling the role of godly justice, suggesting his asexual nature and desire to punish wrongdoers correlates with this portrayal. Carolyn Brown emphasizes Angelo's descent into hypocrisy in Shakespeare and psychoanalytic theory, displayed in his demeanor shift after meeting Isabella. A switch flips, and he goes from a righteous figurehead to the definition of sin. This shift, according to Brown, resulted from the repression of desire deep within his psyche. Scholars have posed the question of whether the goal of this change is simply curbing a sexual appetite, or perhaps something more. One of these other goals is punishment and domination, suggested by David McCandless during an argument depicting Angelo as a sadist. While his craving for domination is sated by his role as interim Duke of Vienna, McCandless argues that Isabella challenges his power and undermines his masculine identity. By exerting power over Isabella, he reclaims the control she held over him. Walter Bajet's Angelo, a natural hypocrite, claims Angelo's propositioning of Isabella for sex in exchange for her brother's life secures his position as a hypocrite, as he is seeking to commit the same act of sin Isabella's brother is on death row for. Collectively, these various studies of Angelo confirm the complexity of his psyche, and affirm that there are psychological explanations for his actions. I believe that the source of the previously noted repressed desires comes from Angelo's failure to experience Freud's three stages of sexual development. Anne B. Doby describes these stages as phases experienced throughout the growth of a child, where they discover a biological desire for sex and learn how to control these desires. It is evident that Angelo never experienced these phases based off of his asexuality early in the play. Angelo is described as cold and detached by both the Duke and Lucio. The Duke scarce confesses that his blood flows in Act 1, Scene 4, corroborated by Lucio, who describes Angelo's blood as snow broth in Scene 5. Lucio then describes Angelo as a person who never feels but rules his demeanor with prophets of the mind. Angelo's blood being cold and demeanor being unmoving implies he experiences no passions, whether sexual or not. However, this is all a facade. Never experiencing sexual development made Angelo all the more susceptible to even the slightest of temptation from Isabella, despite how rigid he appeared. Angelo's success at suppressing his desires up to Act Two is a direct result of the strength and structure of his tripartite psyche. The tripartite psyche, as described by Freud, is divided into three parts that make up an individual's personality. These parts balance each other to create a functional and mentally secure being. The dominant third of the psyche determines the strictness of one individual and the unruliness of another, both eventually seen in Angelo. The superego is the part of the psyche that provides the sense of moral and ethical wrongdoing. One can see that this portion of Angelo's psyche dominates his actions. As Angelo defends his choices of applying severe consequences to those who break the law, his superego rears its head. The id is another third of the psyche, always trying to satisfy a hunger for pleasure. Angelo's id is severely restrained based off of his asexuality and emphasis on thinking with prophets of the mind. This nature completely defies the id's instinct to indulge in pleasure. Angelo even admits that he had never understood men's sexual attraction up to women prior to meeting Isabella stating that this virtuous maid subdues me quite. Ever till now, when men were fond, I smiled and wondered how. The ego acts as a regulating agency for the psyche, keeping a balance between the superego and the id. This filters non-destructive and destructive actions within the self, which is integral to Angelo's mission of maintaining order in the Duke's absence. Angelo's ego and superego work together in making him a law-enforcing powerhouse that exudes assurance in every decision he makes. 
In Act 2, Scene 2, Angelo threatens to fire the provost for even questioning Claudio's sentence. He also feels little sympathy for those he censures, ordering the provost to dispose of Juliet as she prepares to give birth in prison. Angelo's undoing begins with Isabella's begging for mercy for the life of her brother Claudio. It takes Isabella becoming combative and vocal for Angelo's psyche to break down, unleashing his sexual desire for her. This undermining of his authority triggers what McCandless argues is Angelo's need to master sexuality by punishing representatives of his own rejected sexual self. By propositioning Isabella to have sex in order to save Claudio in Act 2, Scene 4, he punishes the sole representation of his repressed sexual desires. Angelo either takes Isabella's virginity and life's purpose, or kills someone she cares about. The fight between Angelo's superego, ego, and id becomes evident as Angelo monologues after Isabella's departure from their first meeting. He exhibits internal guilt and confusion, common when the superego lacks balance and when a person's sexual desires begin to reveal themselves. He narrates, what's this, what's this? Is this her fault or mine? The tempter or the tempted, who sins most? Between scenes two and four, Angelo's id takes control of his psyche. His daydreams and imagination are taken over by Isabella, rather than maintaining focus on his duty to Vienna. Dobie describes that someone who failed to experience sexual development acts as according to the pleasure principle, which dictates that they want immediate gratification of all desires. This becomes evident when Angelo begins scheming for a way to satiate his newfound thirst for Isabella. His id takes full advantage of this lack of sexual development, resulting in his desperate proposition and ultimatum to Isabella. After Angelo has sex with Mariana, who he believed was Isabella, Angelo's monologue reveals the ongoing internal battle he faces between his sexual desires and lawful duties. Having sex made him feel unpregnant and dull to all proceedings. His guilt is evident as he recognizes he still chose to kill Claudio, despite committing the same crime as him. This guilt was enabled in consequence of Angelo's sexual desire being satiated. In Act 4, Scene 4, Angelo became overwhelmed by his sense of moral wrongdoing, exposing him to a guilt complex which commonly occurs within individuals who have too strong a presence of superego. Angelo adopts this complex after having sex with who he believes is a virgin, despite being the eminent body that enforced the law against it. At this point in the play, Angelo's ego has completely disappeared into the recesses of his mind, denying any regulation and stability within the psyche. Angelo only admits his faults when there is nowhere left to hide and his actions can be unequivocally proven by the Duke, Isabella, and Mariana. The words in his submission reflect a man so riddled with guilt that he is tempted by suicide, pleading with the Duke, No longer session hold upon my shame, but let my trial be mine own confession. Immediate sentence, then, and sequent death is all the grace I beg. Although the original stone-cold version of Angelo no longer exists, his verbiage in this scene homages his old self. When I that censure him do so offend, let mine own judgment pattern out my death, and nothing come impartial. Angelo seems to find the most clarity and resignation with the justice-bound figure he once was in these final moments, despite having transitioned from an inhuman to human state of being. This marks the return of his ego, admitting the faults of the id and repairing the guilt complex created by the superego. Angelo has begun to reform his psyche from the perspective of a mortal, not immortal. Angelo had an opportunity to reform Vienna. If successful, there was a potential for him to succeed the Duke in the future. Angelo's methods upheld the high standards of justice at first. However, he was not able to uphold those standards when his morals were truly tested. The unleashing of Angelo's psychosexual desires squashed any opportunity Angelo might have had to rule Vienna one day. The Duke deputized Angelo because his soul seemed good, a valid assumption for his original character. Angelo's desire for dominance destroyed the psyche that the Duke was so fond of, replaced by one rampant with sexual desire and consequently guilt. Ironically, no one, even Angelo, died in the play. Angelo was forced to live as his redefined self, a man riddled with guilt and disappointment in his own actions. He no longer plays the role of an angel, but rather that of a mortal riddled with sin. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my presentation. This is my Works Cited page, and if you have any insights or questions, please feel free to contact me or leave a comment below this video. And I hope you have a great day!